happen? Um, all right, well, um, I will go ahead and start things off today. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar. My name is Ann Hilben Benoit, and I am an emergency management specialist with MSU Extension. I currently serve on the Extension Disaster Education Network, or EDENS, Professional Development Committee. Please take a moment to drop your name and institution in the chat box so that we know who is with us today. Today, our presentation will be on sea level rise in the classroom, fostering science to civics literacy. And our speaker will be Sonia Vedral. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up at the end of the presentation. I would also like to note that this webinar is being recorded. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hang on just a second. Mm -hmm. um, I have dropped the um, link to our evaluation tool for this webinar into the chat box. Um, so if you would, at the conclusion of this webinar, please feel free to fill it out. Um, now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter. Our presenter today is Sonia Vidral. Sonia is an education specialist with PLACE SLR and is based out of Mississippi State University Coastal Research and Extension Center. She works with teachers and students along the Northern Gulf to increase their knowledge about sea level rise and help communities become more resilient. Sonia has a bachelor's degree in biology from Northeastern University and a master's degree in biology from Nova Southeastern University. Sonia, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk about our high school curriculum, sea level rise in the classroom. A uh, note to say, and it's great if we have kind of a small group, is I have an activity where we'll use Google Sheets later um, on in this. So if you have Google Sheets app on your phone um, or want to download it on your phone or you have it on your computer, we'll use that in a little bit. Uh, so Sea Level Rise in the Classroom is a high school science and social studies curriculum. Uh, it has four modules that talk about different topics. It starts off with sea level rise and flooding basics. So it introduces what is sea level rise? Why is it happening? And then the next three modules are all about solutions kind of at the community level. So we have natural solutions, ordinance and policy solutions and community planning. And modules one and two are really the focused on the science and the biology and environmental science, whereas the modules three and four focus on those concepts of social studies, civics, and government. We also have a capstone project where students explore uh, two simulated towns to kind of create their own resilience plan. Um, and during our pilot and beta testing of it, we had a hazard summit where students were able to present their capstone projects to a group of people. And we have originally focused on Mississippi and Alabama, um, but we have a new expansion for the rest of the Gulf. Uh, so go to the next slide. Uh, so our original project was sponsored or funded through uh, National Academies of Science Gulf Research Program. And we had a team of researchers and educators I have all of their logos here. And we worked to uh, with teachers in Mississippi and Alabama and the coastal counties to develop this curriculum. And then this curriculum launched and was released this past summer. And we have a new project with NOAA's Environmental Literacy Program to expand the curriculum to the rest of the Gulf. So we are expanding um, or creating a version for Texas, Louisiana, and Florida, and aligning it to the standards both in science and social studies, as well as math or English, so that teachers across the Gulf can use this um, to introduce the concepts to their students. 
And then just some background about how we even, we got this curriculum. Um, back in the summer of 2019, we drafted the curriculum um, as a general outline. And this was an iterative process with our project team who were subject matter experts in um, built infrastructure and natural infrastructure and sea level rise science and engineering and in community planning. And we also worked with an advisory panel, which was made up of educators, both classroom and non-formal educators, science and social studies. And so together with these two groups, we drafted a curriculum that said, what are the topics that we are important to talk about and how are we gonna talk about them? Then in the fall of 2019, we hosted two educator workshops, one in Mississippi and one in Alabama, and we introduced the curriculum. Um, the goal of these workshops was to build comfort and familiarity with the climate concepts in these educators, as well as for the teachers who attended to provide feedback on both the content as well as the mechanics. Did we lay it out in a way that worked in a classroom? Um, were we talking about something that worked well in a classroom? And so the teachers provided feedback from that feedback, I updated the curriculum, and then in spring 2020, we pilot tested. And in our pilot test, uh, we had 11 teachers or 9 to 11 teachers from Mississippi and Alabama use two of the four modules. So every teacher used module one since it introduced what is sea level rise, why is it important to learn about, and then they used one of the other modules. And this way, everyone was able to kind of take a piece of it and work through it, but we are also able to get feedback on the whole curriculum. Um, and we did have a pilot test redo because of COVID-19. A lot of our teachers had not started using the curriculum content yet when they moved to virtual learning. So we did some updates to so some of it was able to be delivered virtually and we had them do another pilot test in the fall of 2020. And then from there, I updated it and we had a beta test where the teachers, we had a mix of new and returning teachers. They used all four of the modules and did the capstone project. Uh, and those students who participated in the beta test, the top student group from each school, presented their capstone project as a, a virtual hazard summit. We had coastal professionals who work in resilience. So we had um, engineers, we had um, natural resource managers, we had people from um, Grand Bay and Weeks Bay near. Um, as well as from city governments. And it was a mix of kind of small group uh, career discussions as well as student presentations. And then uh, the final curriculum this past summer was released. It's available online. Um, you can find it on our website. Uh, we have it on a couple of our other partner websites as well. Um, but we didn't want to stop there. And so we have our new project with NOAA Environmental Literacy Program to expand it. So we took our final kind of Mississippi, Alabama version of the curriculum, and we're expanding it Gulf wide. So this past fall, I've been working with uh, education advisors, so teachers or people who work in education in Texas and in Louisiana and in Florida for them to kind of review the curriculum, see what parts um, would need to change to better fit their state, as well as finding examples of like where would be a good place to take students on like a field trip or a field experience in that state so that the teachers can make connections out of the classroom. Uh, and then um, we've also been updating all of the curriculum with the new sea level rise projections. So just last week, um, these new trends were released. And so we wanna make sure that our curriculum is as up to date as it can be. And so we're updating not only for the whole Gulf, but also for Mississippi and Alabama so that all of this content is based on the newest science that we have. Um, and we are hosting educator workshops this spring and summer, um, one in each of the Gulf states and two in Florida so that educators can come and I'll give the dates on those workshops. Um, at the end. And then we will have a whole Gulf wide suite of curriculum. And then an overview of what is in each module, what you can expect. Uh, and just a note, the curriculum does build. So teachers can use module one, all of the lessons, and then two, and then three, and then four. And it does build on it, but they don't have to. So if you are interested in just a one off lesson, you can go into the curriculum and use it. Each lesson can be standalone or it can build in any way um, because we do understand that not all teachers have a ton of time um, to add all uh, 13 of these lessons. Um, so they don't have to use all of them, um, but they could if they wanted to. So in module one, um, the first lesson 
frozen in time, ice cores, and Earth's recent climate change, we introduce, well, what is climate versus weather, and what is what is happening with climate change, and why is that happening? And then in the second lesson, rising waters, the ocean is getting too big for its beaches, we talk about how climate change is leading to sea level rise through melting land to ice and the thermal expansion of water. In the third lesson, high tide flooding, rain boots required even on sunny days, we talk about, well, what is high tide flooding and how might you see impacts of sea level rise beyond just storm surge? Um, what are the, the more minute details of sea level rise that are aggravating hazards we already have? And then the final lesson in module one is climate change anom anomalies and suffering economies, and we introduce what does sea level rise or high tide flooding mean for a community, especially if they have like a business district that might have flooding impacts? Um, and we also set up modeling so that students can understand how scientists know what might happen in the future through models. And then in module two, it's our natural solutions. So in the first lesson, tides and wetlands, we introduce, well, what are wetlands? Um, the distribution of plants. And we have uh, this graph is an, an image from this talking about how sea level rise might change where the water moves in a marsh and how the plants would adapt either by um, adding, accreting more soil or moving inland. Uh, in the second lesson, living with living shorelines, we have an activity where we set up four different example shorelines in smaller bins. Um, so you have a shoreline that's just sand, one that's got like a, a plastic bulkhead, so a hard structure, one that's got some plants, so like a living shoreline, and one that has some plants and like maybe some rocks, like an oyster reef, a breakwater. And the students with a clear bucket, you can draw or you can measure the original shoreline and then you put the water and you make waves and you can track the changes on did one of the shorelines keep that sand in place better than the others? Um, it, there is an answer there. Yes, uh, they, they do have different abilities for reducing erosion, um, but the students are able to kind of practice, well, what is a living shoreline and how can we use wetlands to adapt to changing water to make our shorelines more um, resilient. And then the third lesson, Puddles to Gardens, is all about rain gardens because not everybody is located directly on the Gulf or on a river or on a bayou, um, but we can all benefit from better management of water or stormwater. And so this picture is actually an example garden from one of our beta test classrooms, where in this area, it's between two buildings in their school, and all of the drain spouts pour right into this middle part. And so they have a lot of flooding in that area. And so the students um, looked up native plants, as well as some other fruit trees that they were very interested in, and they put together this plan, and then they actually built this rain garden so that they would be able to better manage that runoff from their, their school roofs, um, as well as have some flowers and some fruit trees so that it was something prettier to look at than just kind of flooded uh, grass. And in module three, we introduce ordinance and policy solutions. And so this is where we start talking about um, the, the social studies aspects and why it's important to connect the science that's happening with our communities themselves. So in the first lesson, whose laws anyway, we introduce which level of government is really at the forefront of community resilience. Is it the federal, the state, or the local, the municipal governments? Um, in the third and the second lesson, community assets at risk, we actually have students walk through an assessment of uh, that professionals will use for if you have sea level rise or flooding impacting your community, you can't fix everything all at once. You just don't have the time or the money resources. So you need to make a plan. What is the most important? Um, how do you determine what the most important thing is? And so we have the students walk through an assessment for their community to try to figure out, well, how do you make plans? Where do you focus your energy? And then the third lesson, flooding pains and dream house gains. We introduce what are flood plan planes? Um, how do you choose where to build a house? And then why do certain houses have to be built in specific ways if you're close to the water, if you're in a flood plain? Um, and so this lesson uh, is kind of based on like one of those magazine quiz where you're like, oh, you have these three options. Do you pick mostly A, Bs, or Cs? And so we ask some questions. There's a lot of text here, but it's just asking some questions about like, do you elevate your house? 
Do you cut through the dune in front of your house to get to the beach quicker? Do you leave drainage ditches around you? And so as the students pick what they want for their house, there is actually uh, like an ordinance or a policy that's tied to each of them. So like if they were in a floodplain, they would have to elevate the house to a specific height. And that just makes it um, more resilient and less likely to flood in a um, 100 year flood or a 500 year flood. So they kind of take this quiz and then find out that there are meanings behind why things get built in specific ways. And then in the fourth and final module, it's all about community planning and how to have something successful happen. You do have to engage every member of your community. And so in the first lesson, sea level rise, risk and reward, it's a game. Uh, and I'm not going to go too much into it here because this is actually the activity we're able to play in our group here virtually. Um, so this was a game that's able to be used in the classroom that we have modified for virtual play. Um, but then in the second lesson, stakeholder roll call, we have students have um, like identity badges where there are different people in a community that's experiencing high tide flooding, and they have to talk about what are you they going to do about it. And so everyone has something different that they want, but they do need to come to an agreement because that high tide flooding is affecting them all. And then in the third and final lesson of module four, Kingtown planning with a purpose. Um, this is actually, Kingtown is from a project by the Museum of Science Boston, NOAA, Arizona State University, and Northeastern. And it is a story um, map that has interactive layers where students can see where there is water, um, where the sea level rise is having an impact on Kingtown. And they work through as a group to determine what solution do they want to put into place. And the great thing about Kingtown is that they can actually like submit the solution and the map will show them where that water moves. So they can see the benefit or the trade-offs of different resilience solutions um, and how that water moves. Are there any questions before I move us on to playing sea level rise risk and reward? I do have a question. Do you address any um, issues about um, diversity, racism, or any of those pieces? Because oftentimes um, it's not always equitable who has land that, you know, floods or doesn't flood, right? Like, wealthier people tend to be in places that don't aren't as prone to flooding and um, people who are have a little bit less economic means and or we could talk about race in here too tend to have be more in trouble for disaster or be in live in disaster prone areas yes so we actually touch on that in two places in the curriculum and it can be touched on even more one of the places is actually in the lesson that we're about to play um so i'll explain how that um, differences in resources can be included and then in the first place that we introduce it is back in module one um in the third the third lesson no the fourth lesson where we're talking about like the economics um we do introduce like why do why is it important, especially in the Gulf of Mexico? Um, because there was a study by Martinek et al. in 2017, where the Gulf of Mexico has the highest number of like socially vulnerable communities are also the ones who are more likely to be impacted by sea level rise and not be able to adapt to those changes. Um, so in general across the US, yes, that's a big uh, a, important concept to talk about and even more so in the Gulf of Mexico because many of our communities have other um, aspects of vulnerability that are not even including sea level rise and so it is important to know that not everyone has the resources and what does that mean for your community when you're moving forward and being part of a community means that you do need to address all of the inequalities that might be there. And then I'll go on to sea level rise risk and reward because the other place we introduce it here. Um, so sea level rise risk and reward is a game um, where everyone lives in the same coastal community. You each start off with five coins. Um, that's your, your money that you have available to invest. And you're planning to protect your home for the next like 30 years through 2050. Um, and the way that we would play this to talk about um, a, a non-equitable distribution of resources is Either you can pre-assign people to start off with 
more than five coins or less than five coins, or you can have everybody like roll a die and the number that they get is how many coins they start with. So you can even introduce in this game that you don't have the same starting resource. So your solutions that are available to you are different. Um, there's also extensions for this game where you have to gather money as a community, like your everyone playing the game has to kind of come up with maybe 10 additional coins. And so that could be everyone, if you have 10 players, everyone puts in one coin, or maybe some people don't have extra coins, but some people have a lot of extra coins. You could come up with a solution where people would pay more or less than others based on the extra resources they have. And so this game, this is where we're going to use Google Sheets. So if you have your phone and you have that app, um, or we'll be able to pull it up on the computer. But so your five coins represents the total money that you have to repair, maintain, or modify uh, an adaptation strategy, which I will outline. So we have five different adaptation strategies that you can choose from. Strategy A is you do nothing, and it doesn't cost you anything. Strategy B is that you nourish the beach. So you're adding sand lost from erosion. Um, this land will act as a buffer to sea level rise and this costs one coin. Strategy C is you'll build a dune. Um, so you have, you know, you added some more sand and then you're gonna plant some dune grasses and those grasses will really hold that uh, sand in place. It will offer more protection from erosion and building a dune costs two coins. Uh, strategy D is to elevate your home. Um, you, so you're raising it above base flood, flood elevation or even higher. And so this will allow water to come underneath your house, but will not directly impact your house. And so this costs three coins. And then the final adaptation strategy that you can choose from is strategy E, which is to relocate. So you will move away from the water, but still within your community. So you'll still be able to have um, your community connections to your school uh, and your neighbors, but you're no longer directly on the water. And so this allows your home to be more protected from sea level rise impacts, but still maintain your social contribution, your social connections and contribute to taxes in your town and to relocate costs for coins. So every Everyone has five coins and you have to pick one of these options. So I'm going to leave this up for a minute for you to think kind of because I'm going to make you pick. We're going to play. Um, so think about which strategy you, you want to do, how much money you want to spend or save. Um, and if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat or you can come off mute. And you don't have to tell me what strategy you're picking, but keep it in your mind, A, B, C, D, or E. And I'll come back because now we'll talk about the future scenario narrative. So in this game, um, we are looking right into 2050 and there are four different sea level rise projections that we're going to come into play and consider. Uh, we could have the low scenario. So in scenario one, it would be low and along the Northern Gulf of Mexico, this is about 0.8 feet by 2050. Uh, we could have the scenario two, which is our intermediate low, which would be one foot. Scenario three is our intermediate at one and a half feet. And scenario four is our intermediate high at two feet. So these are kind of the, the sea level rise projections that we're contemplating as we're adapting our home. And we're going to use dice to determine the, oops, we're going to use dice to determine what is the future scenario we're in and how does that pay off? So each of those adaptation strategies I showed on two slides ago, A, B, C, D, or E, cost a different amount of money, but they also protect to the different scenarios differently. So if you do nothing, it's no money, but it doesn't give you any protection. So it doesn't even protect you against the low scenario, whereas each step up protects you to one additional scenario. So we'll use the dice outcome to determine which scenario we land in and based on which strategy you picked, your home would be protected or not. If you adequately protected your home, so if you protected it to scenario two, we landed in a scenario two or, or scenario one, you would get to keep all your coins and you even get two bonus coins as a reflection of homeowner savings. 
And if you did not adequately protect your home, you have to pay one coin for each scenario level of difference. So if you only protected to scenario one, but we ro rolled a scenario two, you have to pay one coin. And the way we're going to play this, since we're all virtual, we're not close together, we're going to go to a Google Sheet. So you can either pull out your phone and scan the QR code, um, or I will type it in the chat. And I'm going to um, exit out of this presentation so that we can have this pulled up here. Um, so I have the copy link. I'll put this link in the chat. But go ahead, come over to this sheet, and you're only going to type in the cells that have boxes. So come up underneath each player will have a different column. Um, if there's nobody there, go to like player one, player two, player three, player four, player five, and write your name. And then you can select the drop down menu to pick your strategy A, B, C, or D. So go ahead and there's one, two, three, four, five, five other people on this call. So go in here, type your name. I'll go here to six, Sonia. All right, and I, just so that we can see the, the differences as we play, I'm gonna make a test. Um, I'm gonna cover the rest of the letters. So we've got A and then I'll do B, C, D, E. Okay, test. Um, so how this game works is underneath, it already has a formula where it's calculating the change in um, the number of coins. So when we play virtually, we don't have to do any math about how many coins you got to save or you have to pay to the bank. Um, so it's a great way to make the game move a little bit quicker. And then I have two dice right here. So I'm gonna actually roll physical dice. I'll tell you what the sum is and that will determine if we're in um, which scenario we are in. Um, oops, I'm gonna move this over here. Okay, so for the first roll, I've got a four and a one. So I've rolled, we've rolled a five and I'll type this in. And so automatically it updates how many coins you have. So that first number was how many you have after paying for your adaptation strategy. Now we know how well you were protected. Um, and so when we rolled a five, that means that we were in scenario three, which was our intermediate, um, intermediate scenario, which was uh, one and a half feet of sea level rise for the Northern Gulf. All right, for round two, I'm going to roll. I got two fours. So we have an eight. And so an eight is scenario two. So that's our intermediate low scenario, which is one foot of sea level rise by 2050. And then round three. I rolled two, a two. I have a one and a one. And so a two is actually scenario four. That is our intermediate high with two feet of sea level rise. And so at the point in the game right here, we have a turn for insurance because um, we have it after round three to show that after a disaster or after flooding happens, your insurance does take a little bit of time. You don't get that money immediately. It takes some time. So if you lost money in round one, you will get money now on your insurance. And so based on our game from round one, only two people, two tests got money back. And now we have a time where you can determine if you want to switch your adaptation strategy. If you want to switch to something else and you have enough money, 
you can go into the drop down menu and pick a different strategy. Uh, in the case of this one or this one, there's negative money. They would not be able to change the strategy, even if they wanted to, because they just don't have the resources. So go ahead right now and pick if you want to change, pick a different number. And if you don't want to change, just say none. So if I want to change my strategy, mm -hmm. does like, and I want to go to the next level, is it going to cost me the, the original three coins more, or is it just going to cost me one more coin? It's going to cost you the original, uh, yeah. the original price. Um, gotcha for two reasons. One, it's just easier to do it that way in gameplay. Um, and then also, if these are real adaptation strategies in this game, they're, they're additive, they build up. Um, but in real life, building a dune or elevating your house are two separate projects. So even though one gives you more protection, it's not cheaper to do one and then the next one. Okay, um, excellent. So it doesn't look like anyone is changing their role. Um, I'm just going to copy and then plain paste is how I did this. Um, and then don't, I'm gonna just change all our letters back since we didn't switch. We're just gonna go to what they were originally just so that the formulas can work. All right, and now we have two more rolls. I have a two and a one, so a three, which puts us in scenario four, which is that intermediate high. And then for our final roll, I have a five and a two, so a seven, which is the most common number that could be rolled. It's a scenario one. Um, and with our final outcome, we have conditional formatting. So it highlights the people who had the highest score, the highest number of coins at the end of this game are the dark green. So it looks like when we picked scenario E, um, which was to relocate, that ended up being the best payoff for the end. Um, and then the worst, this dark red, was scenario A, doing nothing. Uh, I'm going to go back to sharing this screen. No, not from the beginning. Um, I'm going to share this. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint again? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Um, so reflections. In this specific game, paying the most money at the front end ended up being the winner. Um, but what is I do really like about the game is that's not always the case. Um, we were rolling a lot of scenario four. Uh, so we were being fairly unlucky in the dice roll um, and having like those more high levels of sea level rise. Um, but sometimes if we're rolling a seven, which is the most common sum that you can get in two dice, having scenario um, C or D sometimes ends up being the winner. Uh, so it's not always paying the most money is the best payoff. It's paying, being a little bit conservative can help, but sometimes it just comes out to what is ending up happening in our environment. I don't think this applies to anyone except for my tests, but based on that kind of um, observations, if someone didn't choose to do a big adaptation in the beginning when they had the resources, how did that impact later on when there was the option to change? And I'll ask that question if anyone wants to answer. If I remember correctly, they ended up running out of money, so they didn't have the money to make the adaptation when they realized that they should have. Yeah. So sometimes if you didn't make the, 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 that strategy choice in the beginning, you ended up not even saving money, but losing money, and then you couldn't get out of that situation. Uh, and then I kind of answered this, which strategies seem to be the most resilient. Um, doing nothing, strategy A, is never the right choice. Um, that will never let you win. Uh, but the other strategies do kind of swap off, depending on how lucky we are in the dice rolls. 
And what about if we're looking at this community wise versus individual? Is there a difference if between like what happened to you specifically versus everybody who was playing this game, right? We were all neighbors. We all had houses together. Anyone want to take a take a shot at that answer? I'll, I'll fill in the silence. Um, so if we're playing, if you're playing with a classroom, that can be students can get really competitive. Adults can get really competitive too. But then if you reframe it and say, well, even if you won, but some of your neighbors lost a lot of money, that doesn't mean that your community was resilient. That might mean that your friends might have to move away. Um, so it is important to be thinking about our communities. It's not just about the individual and how good or lucky you were in your choices, um, but thinking of a community as a whole and how resilient everyone can be together, which might mean sharing resources. Uh, and then the outcomes might seem a little predictable, uh, but sea level rise is fairly predictable. We do have the scenarios um, to know what our future sea level rise projections are. There are different likelihoods for our intermediate or our low all the way up to our intermediate high and high scenario. Um, so if we are building a house or a, a hospital or a wastewater treatment plant, we can plan for how conservative we need to be. Do we have any availability for risk? Um, or do we really need to have this nothing ever happen to it for a significant number of decades? Um, so we can plan for sea level rise um, so that our homes, our communities, our hospitals, all of the resources that we need are protected as best they can and will be able to um, weather any future sea level rise changes. And then continuing with the curriculum, um, this curriculum is like a uh, lesson plans and like some virtual content, um, but it doesn't have a component where we get them outside. So we have a list of recommended field trips um, with partners in Mississippi, Alabama, and then soon to be Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. We have uh, highlighted different environmental education centers or self-guided field trips that will get the students outside so that they can see some of the, um, the content that they're learning about in the curriculum. Uh, we also have, as part of the curriculum, a written, a capstone project, which is a written project with a presentation, and they develop a resilient plan for one of two simulated towns. So we have Sunrise Bayou, um, which is a low-lying community surrounded by marsh and river. And we also have Waterside Village, which is a barrier island um, and more of a, a bigger port city. Um, both of these towns, they are... Um, representative of relocations along the Gulf Coast. Um, so Waterside Village is a made up name, um, but all of the content in population, income, social vulnerability, storm surge, sea level rise, all of that content is actually real content for where this town does exist. Um, and the, the students can play around with this, develop their resilience plan, take into account different stakeholder project, projections, um, perspectives, without any bias of understanding where that real town is. And so there's information for both of the towns um, and students, they can make their uh, their plan based on what they find important. Is it to protect the schools? Is it to protect the industry? Is it to make sure that the area that has the highest social vulnerability is better able to um, keep up with any civil rise changes? Uh, and then educators have the option to how deep dive they want to have their students go. This can be a, a simpler project or it can be like a really long-term um, research project for the students to present. And then during our beta test, we had our two virtual hazard summits. So the top student group from each of the schools competed um, to present their resilience plan. Um, we invited local professionals who work in resilience so that they could ask questions to the students and so that the students could have like a mini career fair. Um, and they were able to present their plans um, to, to adults who are working in this um, and were inspired by hearing all of the creativity that the students had. 
And then if you want to find the curriculum, um, we have it on our website. So placeslr.org. You go to our products, go down to Sea Level Rise curriculum, and then it brings you up to Sea Level Rise in the classroom. And it's all kind of sorted under these expanding um, tabs. So you can click on whichever module you want. And then all of this kind of lighter gray text is a link. So you can either go directly to the PDFs or you can go onto the Google Drive folder. And we have the lessons as Word documents. So they're editable um, PDFs, PowerPoints, um, and spreadsheets and virtual activities all linked there. And then also, if you are interested in coming to a workshop to really dive deep into each of the lessons, or if you have any stakeholders in Texas all the way through Florida, um, educators or people who work with educators who would be interested, we are doing our whole suite of workshops um, where we'll be able to dive into all of the content, work through these lessons. There's a $100 stipend for the teachers who come as well as CEUs. Um, so you can scan the QR code or, um, I'll chat the link if you want this. All right, and then that is my presentation. So if anyone has questions, I will answer them as best I can. If you would, if you do have questions, if you type them into the chat box, that would be very helpful. And then we'll go through them from there. It's going to be faster just to say, say the question. Um, Sonia, are you planning to present? I know you, you've presented at NMEA last year. Are you planning to present at the FAMSI conference this year, the Florida Marine Science Educators Conference? Um, so I have not planned to present in Dimsy because I actually I'm in same um, and I, we do t we have the, the panhandle. Right. Um, but yeah, I might try. When is the FIMSI? It's end of April, beginning of May, I think. I have to look it up. Another opportunity in Florida is the Florida Association of Science Teachers Conference. That's usually in October. Very cool. All right. I will reach out. Who would be a good contact for FIMSI? Let me see if I can. Um, I can send you the link to the website. Yeah. Um, if you send me that, I'll reach out to them because I'd love to talk about this more, love to get people signed up for these workshops. Um, we want to fill, we have enough space for 15 people at each of the workshops and I want them full. I want everybody there. Um, the whole reason we even expanded to the rest of the Gulf was when we were working on it in Mississippi and Alabama, people were reaching out saying, hey, like, I want to bring this to my classroom. Do you have a version for me? Yeah, and I can help you get stuff on the FEMC listserv too. Awesome, maybe. thank you. Are there any more questions? Yeah, not a question, but I'm probably gonna bug you to maybe do something for the Florida Sea Grant folks. Yes. Yeah, because I am technically also Florida Sea Grant, um, yep. but I'd love to talk more about it. So definitely, if you want me to talk, let me know. And doing the hands-on is, as you know, the best way of getting people to actually implement it. And a lot of our agents do summer camps, and I can see them, even though the students are usually more middle school age, I can see them adapting this really easily for that age group. Yeah, and so a lot of the concepts are really um like we build off of like the high school concepts and go even further um but we have had this be used in like a mixed eighth grade ninth grade class and we've had middle school teachers use it um so the pieces can be taken out and used with different audiences also i see in the chat abby asked in a broader spectrum of climate vulnerability how would you see this as an adaptation of this program working for a landlocked or non-coastal state or community um so even though we're expanding for the rest of the Gulf, uh, it really could be used anywhere right now. Um, and the rest of the Gulf didn't necessarily need a specific expansion um, if they wanted to talk about it in a general sense. So we've had a teacher use this in Virginia, um, which I understand has a coast, but this teacher is not on the coast. We've had teachers use it in other um, states as well, as well as in non-coastal counties uh, because the general concepts can be used and be applicable anywhere. We kept a lot of the like 
um, case studies pretty uh, pretty vague, um, pretty general, so that teachers would be able to make the connections that would be meaningful for the students wherever they were. Um, and we do talk about concepts like rain gardens, which anywhere it rains um, doesn't have to be on the coast could benefit from having a rain garden. Um, ordinances and floodplains are around rivers as well. So if there's water flooding, um, these concepts can still be applicable um, so that teachers can use it, can talk with their students. Are there any additional questions for Sonia? Well, great. Um, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. A reminder, this webinar will be archived on the Eden YouTube channel and distributed through the listserv. Um, so if you'd like to go back and review it later and some of the helpful links that we've been provided, please feel free to take a look. Um, with that being said, um, this will conclude the webinar. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you.